all by himself, too, because the disciples have gone into the, the town to get lunch. Number three, she's a Samaritan. Jews and Samaritans don't get along. A Samaritan could defile him. But number four, she's sexually loose. She's had five husbands. She's sleeping with some dude who's not her husband. Jesus, how could you? Guilty by association. Don't talk to her. You're a rabbi, fifth reason. You're a rabbi. Holy men. Oh, sinful woman. This is not, it shouldn't be. Don't do it. <laughs> but he does. He opens up the religious box, Pandora's box to some, but the box that's going to lead ultimately to the salvation of this woman and of this town. So already, what have we learned? And we're only in the beginning of the story. The scandal at the well invites us to take a risk, to re-examine the margins of our little cultural religious world and to cross them. If we want to follow Jesus, we need to be willing to give grace to anyone. Simply by asking for a cup of water, Jesus has extended a most unexpected kindness and grace. And finally, we bear witness to the truth of who Jesus is by graciously reaching out in love to the very people who offend, i.e. scandalize, our sense of moral decency. I was in Barcelona, Spain two years ago, walking down the main drag in Barcelona is called the Rambla, sort of like our 4th Street, but a lot bigger, a lot more people. And right there on the Ramblas, you, you have to walk by the group of prostitutes that are there. And I'm walking home to my, my youth hostel there early in the evening. And as I'm passing by, this thought occurs to me, wow, uh, I could go back to my youth hostel or... I see that there's a Burger King across the street here. What if I went over and, and asked one of these prostitutes to go to dinner? That way I could take her off the streets for an hour, and who knows what good might come about by simply having dinner with this woman. Obviously, I thought about some other things, too. <laughs> that might be somewhat scandalous. What if one of the parishioners from Rainbow Covenant Church are walking down the Rambles at that exact moment when I walk with a prostitute across the street to Burger King and, isn't that Pastor Mark? <laughs> Wouldn't that be a little bit guilty by association? <laughs> but I approach and I, I say, you know, you'll pardon me, but um, you know, how, how much do you charge for an hour? Right there on the street. She says, it's, it's 40 euro for an hour. And I quickly clarify my intentions. Um, is it all right if we just talk for, for the hour? And she said, no way. I'm not going to listen to all your problems. <laughs> so I thought it was a great response. I, so I clarified some more. No, I just kind of want to have more of a, a normal conversation. And there's this, it's a double decker. It's a two-story Burger King right there on the, on the Ramblas in Barcelona. And I said, well, ju I'm just going to buy you some dinner. And we're just going to talk for an hour. What do you say? And so it took, it, took, it took me persuading her <laughs> for about five minutes before she said, okay. So we walk over to the Burger King, get her dinner. We walk upstairs, eating dinner, Burger King, start to get to know her a little bit. You know, I wanted to hear her story. I wanted her to remember, if anything else, I you know, obviously didn't know anything about her, but I thought, if, if nothing else, to remind her that she's made in God's image, that she is first and foremost a precious and loved always daughter of the highest king, her maker. That was my goal. So we start talking. She starts telling me she grew up in Ghana. She's African, uh, 24 years old, had this horrible experience uh, dating the love of her life for seven years, and then he's tragically killed and murdered. And so she leaves Ghana to flee all the pain and the memories. I'm sure every place reminded her of him. And so she came to Spain, but as an illegal alien, couldn't get work as an illegal alien. That's how she ends up on the street. After 15 minutes of telling me a little bit of her life story, she pauses and she goes, so what do you do? <laughs> and I said, because <clears throat> yeah, I probably would never have told her if she didn't ask, but she asked. I said, well, I'm a pastor. And that kind of changed the course of the conversation. <laughs> got, she got very tender 
got very soft, and she started telling me about how she grew up in church in Ghana, how she was singing in the choir, how much she loves the Lord. And then with tears running down her face, she started singing to me in the upper deck of Burger King Barcelona, the pastor and the prostitute, songs from her church. And it was a holy moment where she remembered not just that she's made in the image of God, but that she remembered who she was in Christ. Walked back down to the Ramblas, gave her a big hug, said goodnight, went back to my youth hostel. We bear witness to the truth of who Jesus is by graciously reaching out in love to the very people who offend and scandalize our sense of moral decency. That is what Jesus is doing in this story. That is what I was attempting to do in Barcelona. But back to the story we've just begun. Verse 9. The Samaritan woman said, You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Literally in the Greek, Jews do not uh, drink from or use the utensils of a Samaritan because it would ritually defile a Jew. But Jesus has asked to actually drink from her cup because Jesus reorders everything. He doesn't get impure. Instead, he brings holiness to her because he's our out-of-the-box thinking Jesus, you see. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus said, lady, I could just see Jesus a little bit of a smile here. Lady, if you knew who I was, you wouldn't be offended that I asked you for a drink. You, you, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me because I got the biggest gift that you could ever get. It's called eternal life. And I'm going to give you this nice little, you know, mysterious term, living water, because he doesn't reveal himself right away, does he? He doesn't come up to her and first thing he says is, lady, you need to get saved, okay, because I know all about you. And I, you know, that's not how, that's not, this is a model of evangelism where Jesus basically raises her curiosity through this conversation. That's what he does. He leads with grace. He's saving truth a few verses later. Living water is a normal term. It's like running water like this. It's the difference between a living water is like a spring Versus a well, or another word for a well, is a cistern. So he says he wants to give her this gift. Everyone who drinks this water from the well is going to get thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Pretty big statement coming from a stranger. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, probably thinking something like, does this guy have some, like, secret hidden spring, like maybe closer to my house so I don't have to come all the way up here with my big jar? Cool. And so she says, sir, give me this water so that I don't have to get thirsty and keep coming here to, you know, draw water with my big jar. She's obviously thinking the physical lane, uh, physical lane, physical plane. Jesus is obviously thinking on the spiritual plane. And now Jesus, after leading with grace, now comes the truth. Before she can receive the living water that he has for her, this gift of eternal life, now we've got to talk a little bit. He told her, go call your husband and, and then come back. And then I'll show you the secret spring, right, the living water. I have no husband, she replies. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands and the man you have now, i.e. the man you're sleeping with right now, he's not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman replied, um... I can see you're kind of a prophet. So Jesus just went from being some strange guy that might have some weird spring hidden somewhere to, whoa, let me reevaluate who this person is. Right? You've just uncovered my deepest, darkest sins and pain. Because before Jesus can give the living water, the greatest gift that we all need, sin, wounds, pain, they need to be exposed if Jesus is going to heal them. So Jesus theologically here exposes her, leaves her biggest sin kind of waving there in the afternoon sun. In effect, Jesus says, I got a gift. I got a gift that will quench your deepest thirst, but you got to deal with this thing, your mood. 
bam, back in her lap. What would you do? Jesus has exposed your greatest sin of your life. What's your next step? For her, I think she did what a lot of us would do. She deflects. She says, um, changes the subject altogether. You know, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, Gerizim. You Jews claim the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. In effect, she says, hey, how about those A's? How about those giants? Hey, anything other than talking about me and my sin. Let's talk about religion. Let's talk about little religious controversy.